Good to be with you guys. Excited to close our time in the book of Ruth. Been going through that series, uh, Redeeming Love, studying the scriptures. Once again, not just trying to share background to grow in knowledge, but trying to bring application uh, to what is behind God's word, what it means for us today, how it speaks to him. Looking forward to continuing that today. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Flip to Ruth chapter 4. We'll finish chapter 4 today. Next weekend we'll close up, like Kelly said, uh, with a discussion weekend. I enjoy those as well. What? Why do we do those? That's a great question. I don't know. Why do we do those? <laughs> uh, we do discussion weekends because I was pretty con convicted early on in ministry that um, t a typical uh, congregation that has normal pastors will preach 52 messages, sometimes even a Good Friday message or a Christmas Eve, an extra. And each message has application. And I'm, I'm uh, kind of witnessing a church really not growing in the application of all these 52 messages. And so I was like, what if we slowed it down and stopped and processed what we're trying to grow in? And so uh, we do that. In and throughout any sermon series, we'll have at least a discussion, if not more. Like when we go through the book of Galatians, I think it's going to be like a 18 week series. So it's, we're going to go really slow through Galatians and there's probably six uh, discussion weekends throughout to process God's word and apply it and to practice what God is proclaiming in our lives. So that's the, the reason we do discussion weekends. Yep, that's the main reason we do discussion weekends. Uh, uh, so last, last uh, this past weekend, last weekend, last Sunday, we spoke to Ruth, first part of chapter four, and we got to the, the point of last weekend's message was how we don't have to worry about the future because there's a redeemer. Ruth didn't have to worry about the future because she had a redeemer, nor do we have to worry about the future because we have a redeemer. Believers in Jesus have been redeemed. And, and then I shared a little bit about the future power of the gospel. And uh, I, I want to just uh, hone in on that a little more for a second to be clear at what I was trying to say. All right. So, so basically, the gospel could be summed up with the person and work of Jesus. The gospel is the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. Now, when I say work of Jesus... I don't want us to be thinking his baptism, his miracles, and all these different things that he's done because all those things were all good and they proved to who he is, who he said he was. But when I say the work of Jesus, we're summarizing the work of Jesus uh, with uh, seven different things. And I want to just highlight those again because it's super important for us to understand these seven uh things that express Jesus' work because that is what saves us. His work is what saves us. So the first is his birth, which describes who he is. The second is his sinless life. The third work, if you will, of Jesus is his perfect death. The fourth work would be his resurrection. The fifth work would be his ascension. Uh, the sixth work would be his sending of the Holy Spirit, sending of himself in spirit form to dwell within the believer. And the seventh would be his promised return. And each one of those experiences of his work means something for us when we believe it. And so we don't have time to go deep into that. We can talk more about it in our discussion weekend next weekend of, in, in regards to the future power of the gospel. But the future power of the gospel points to Jesus' promised return. In the future, there's power in and through Jesus' return for us. And that power is 
that the gospel, Jesus' work of his return, will eliminate the presence of sin in our lives. And that's some good news. I was hanging out with Barbara several times, uh, I don't know, five, six times over the last couple weeks. And Barbara's in her last days, literally probably today, if not tomorrow. And uh, I, got, I had the privilege to read with her her favorite book of the Bible, which is Ruth. Because Barbara's from Europe. She's a foreigner. Barbara's first husband died, just like Ruth's first husband Barbara got remarried to a really, really nice guy. Reminds me of a Boaz. And Barbara has an amazing story that parallels the, the book of Ruth. She feels like God gave her this book. And so it's always meant so much. So we had the privilege to read through that over the last couple weeks. And, uh, and I just was, I was with her. The last time I was with her uh, was a day and a half ago. And Carol was with me. And I was praying with her and we sat together and I talked with her and I was crying my eyes out. But they weren't tears of sadness. They weren't tears of sadness. They weren't tears of joy. But it was emotion. It was emotion being expressed. And every time I talked about the future power of the gospel, of what is in store for her moments away, of what she gets to receive in Christ. I like would start crying because I'm so excited about that for her and for me and for us. I told her, because I get to talk to Jesus all the time. I didn't say, hey, tell Jesus this because I tell him things all the time. But what I don't get to do with Jesus, I don't get to slap a hug on him. So I told Barbara, after you hug and cling to Jesus, I want you to grab him again and say, this one's for art. (laughs) And she just smiled. She shared a lot, but I couldn't understand. I think she was either praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, or which includes her her native language, (laughs) Dutch, uh, which she would rather speak. But I share this because I want to, I want to praise Jesus and I want to honor Barbara Um, she's one of the last of the Mohicans if you will she was one of the last uh, the ladies who we inherited with this building and uh, so it's a it's a it means a lot it's a special time so I hope to go see her again today but she's living in the moment of embracing the future power of the gospel right now And it's good news. For the last year and a half or so, she's been saying, I want to go to see Jesus. I want to go see Jesus. I can't wait to go see Jesus. I'm done here. So that's a little bit more. Hoping to bring some clarity to last weekend's um, training piece. Uh, Today, there's a different training piece for us. We're going to see that the chapter, chapter 4 of Ruth closes with a, a, a humongous blessing. It closes with a blessing that I'm convinced is for all of us as well. And so we're going to go ahead and dive into Ruth chapter 4. Um, so let's go ahead and read this together. God's word. All right. Ruth chapter 4 verses 13 through 22. So Boaz took Ruth into his home. And she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. And she gave birth to a son. Then the woman, then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast and she cared for him as if he were her own. 
The neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. This is the genealogical (laughs) record, sorry, of their ancestor Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon or Nashon. Nashon was the father of Solomon. Solomon was the father of Boaz, and Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. All right. So there you have it. Our closing verses. Verse 13, it starts with, uh, So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled, I want us to pay attention to that piece, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. Where's the first place in Scripture that we ever hear a woman, a man, give credit to God for the children they bore? Where do we remember the very beginning, who first gave credit to God for the child they born? Eve. Eve. Yeah, Adam and Eve. In that story, Eve instantly knew, I could not have done this on my own. I did not, I didn't know this would happen. I, I don't know how this happens, but God enabled Eve to birth uh, Cain and then Abel. And so here we have the Lord enabled her, Ruth, to become pregnant and she gave birth to a son. Now this is, this is the only the second time that God is mentioned in the book of Ruth in an active way. God is indirectly talked about, but in an active way, this is the only second time that it mentions God did this. The first time was in chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So it's God's doing of blessing them with a harvest. So Naomi goes back with Ruth from Moab. Now, in both cases... This one with the, the, uh, the harvest and the one with giving birth is uh, a, re- a blessing. God is blessing them in both those ways. Now verse 14, verse 14 says, Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, so giving credit where credit's due, who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. So I want to be clear here. Verse 14 says, Then the women of the town said to Naomi, not Ruth. They said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. So Boaz was a literal redeemer for Ruth. This baby is a literal redeemer for Naomi. This baby is the one, this son is the redeemer. He's the one who's going to bless and care for Naomi as she age, as she ages. And so the women know that, and this is all connected to the Leveret Law. And so they're praising God for um, blessing uh, Naomi with this son who is referred to as a redeemer, this redeeming son. Now, I, as I think of a redeeming son, remind me, who else was a redeeming son? Jesus was a redeeming son. Came from a woman, was a redeeming son. This next verse, as uh, we, we read verse 15, speaks more of this redeeming son. It says, may he, this redeeming son, restore your youth and care for you in your old age. <clears throat> for he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. As I think of this, two phrases here, restoring your youth 
and caring for you in your old age. Restoring your youth is almost like I, I think of uh, giving you, uh, making you young again, almost like being born again, right? Be, becoming new again, a new identity again. Because this redeeming son, there is bringing back a restoration and making new for uh, Naomi. Just like our redeeming son makes us new as we're referred to as new creations in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we see this takes place for her and for us through our redeeming son, Jesus. Now, this son is constantly throughout this whole passage pointing to Jesus. He's the redeeming son for Naomi. We have a redeeming son in Christ for us. This verse, verse 15, as I finish here, this is better uh, to you. The last phrase, this daughter-in-law, Ruth, is who loves you, has been better to you than seven sons. Now, that's a huge compliment. That's a, hu- that's a big deal. Because if you think about seven sons, what comes with seven sons? One, it's God's favor. You have sons. It's, it's a, that's a blessing. But better than sons is one who produces another son. So here, in the ancient Near East culture, as you know, women weren't looked at, at like the same as men, right? Maybe like property. Uh, they were definitely a subculture to men in the ancient Near East culture. And here, Ruth was just elevated above not just one man, but seven sons. And so there was a ton of respect given towards Ruth in this. Now, also think about this background. Ruth was married 10 years to uh, Malon, one of uh, Naomi's sons. There was not abstinence there, but there was no children. For 10 years, there was no children. And here, there was a child instantly by God's grace given to both Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi here. Uh, Verse 16 and 17 say this, Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast, and she cared for him as long as if she were, uh, uh, let's see, sorry, cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David, both referring and pointing to David. So he's the father of Jesse, and he's also the grandfather of David. Now, in this other translation, say he, she cuddled him in her bosom, right? She, she held him tight as if he were his, her own. And in doing this, uh, the first thought I have is, Chapter one, she comes back empty-handed. Now she's full-handed. She has uh, her hands full with this baby, this child, and they're giving credit as if he's literally her own, which is true according to this law, is now she's been, she's received this redeeming son. And uh, here we have uh, this son being born and given the name of servant or Obed, which means servant. Now, Obed, meaning servant, is once again pointing to the greater servant, the one who said, I I came not to be served, but to serve. And it's Christ and Christ alone. And they highlight David as this uh, king who has transformed the face of Israel. Verses 18 through 22 This is the genealogical record of their ancestor, Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon, father of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. So interesting to me, and in this, this book ends with this genealogy. It ends with this idea of, because it starts with a loyal family. It starts with an intimate view, zoomed in view of this loyal family, these people who love each other. And then it ends with this zoomed out picture of a royal family. And it's picking up from Perez, 
We have the end of the, the royal family or the blessed family, the favored family of God, starting with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, going all the way through Judah. We see Judah, then Tamar, and there's some twins, and Perez, it's picked up from Perez, which is right there, and it's carried through David. So it gives us all the generations of that blessed family line. And so here we see that Obed was a blessing. He wasn't just a blessing for Boaz and Ruth. He was a, a blessing to Naomi, as we see in this passage. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, he was Not only to Ruth and Boaz was Obed a blessing, but he was a, a blessing to Naomi. He was a blessing to Naomi because it, he was basically her, her new son, right, who would care for her. Not only was Obed a blessing to Naomi, but he was a blessing to Bethlehem. Bethlehem would now be famous once again. The, the blessing would continue. God is showing up still because everybody who lived in and through Bethlehem can point to the, the forefathers of their spiritual heritage through a, a Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then they see it pass through uh, Judah and they see it pass on to, to Perez. And they're like, he's doing it again. God is doing it again. Here it's Obed. Obed is the redeemer. He's redeemed the family line. It's going to continue. And so Obed is a blessing to the hometown of Bethlehem. But not only is he a blessing to Bethlehem, he's a blessing to Israel. And once again, as it points to Israel, and they, they're writing this through the back lens of David, who's already happened saying, look what God did. It happened. He's used this and it led to David, who is our great king, which brings about the, the, the season of life where King David reigned, where Israel was made great among all nations. And so Obed was a redeeming blessing to, to many, many people. We know that King David being pointed to this, this pinnacle king for Israel, as it, it says in the scriptures here, may this baby be famous in Israel. We see that ultimately pointing to the future baby who has not only just made Israel famous, but the world. He was famous in the world's eyes. And that's Jesus, who was the greatest king over David. The Israelite people, the Jews today, still don't see that. Still don't see that. But Jesus is the ultimate king who reigns in the ultimate kingdom. And so I think of, as I think of this blessing, if you look back at our passage today, if you look at our passage, not just today, but the whole book, of all the book, it points to these Two righteous people. It points to Ruth, and the whole time Ruth is a blessing. And it points to Boaz. Two people who were most dedicated to God. Though the book highlights and always points to Naomi as like the centerpiece, right, who carries on the name and the tradition and the blessed family line. But among this story in our passage today and of the last several weeks, we see Ruth and Boaz were the closest to God, and those, those who were the closest to God were the most blessed. And they blessed others. Boaz was known as this rich man who had land. Ruth was a blessing to Naomi in the very beginning. She followed her. Now, we see Ruth being a blessing also to ultimately Boaz, who was madly in love with her. She was a blessing to him. She was almost like his redemption, his blessing, his gift. And so we see Ruth blessing many people. She was looked at as a virtuous. And then we see Boaz also bless Ruth, bless Naomi, whether it was monetary, food, drink, whatever it was. We see both those individuals blessing the most people in the storyline. And there is not an accident that those two individuals were also closest to God. Those who walk close to God ought to be not just blessed themselves, 
but bless other people. In uh, our, our teachings, we, we talk about the gospel a lot. We talk about our gospel identity for those who believe in the gospel. Gospel identity is, is we, we'll get into this a lot more later. It's we are family, we're missionaries, and we're servants because it's connected to God's identity. God is father, so we're family. Uh, we're missionaries because the sent one, the spirit's the sent one. And we're servants because of the whole, because of Jesus, the greatest servant among us. So we have a gospel identity that we ought to live out. We also, I refer to them as gospel rhythms. And we have rhythms on, every culture has these rhythms, but the redeemed rhythms when a believer lives them out purposefully centered in Christ. And I want to go through those rhythms today, but I want to hone in on one rhythm, and you'll see the one in a moment. The first rhythm is story formed. I'm going to be brief on this. First rhythm is story formed. It literally means we all have stories. We're all listening to a voice, trying whether it's climbing up a, a, a ladder in society. Uh, maybe it's wanting more money, working, success, whatever that storyline or voice in your mind uh, or head is. We have a story. God has a greater story, and we can find ourselves within that story. And when we find ourselves in that story, we start to find our real purpose in life. So that's the first rhythm. Uh, the second rhythm is listen, constantly listening to God, forward and backwards. We listen to God backwards, being in his word, listening to how he spoke, what he is saying, what he has said, and listening to God forward in and through the Holy Spirit because God is constantly talking through the Spirit and he's guiding us uh, in and through every day. The next rhythm is celebrate. Every culture celebrates to some degree something. And so here we would celebrate. We have the most to celebrate knowing and understanding the person and work of Jesus, which through the lens of God, we should be the best, most celebratory people in the world. We should be like party animals because our king created celebration. The next one's bless. I'm going to skip that for now because that's what we're going to hone in on. Uh, the next uh, rhythm is eat. Uh, we are to eat unto the Lord. So this encompasses, you know, what we eat, how we eat, how often we eat. But most importantly, using food to eat purposefully with other people to connect with them and with God and point to him in and through each meal. And the last rhythm is recreate. It's two words put together. It's like rest and create where there's work and play and everything else outside of that is put together in uh, this rhythm. And ultimately this rhythm of recreate is we do all things through the spirit of rest. We do all things through the spirit of rest. So we rest while we work. We rest while we play. Because we can easily go on vacation and be worn out. We can easily uh, do so many things and our mind is not at rest. So there's, we could spend more time on that as well. But I want to go back to bless. Because that's ultimately what I believe this last section of the scriptures in the book of Ruth is about. Obed being an ultimate blessing for all those parties I spoke to before. So every single person has been blessed by God. We've all been blessed by God. God promised that would happen as he gives a promise to Abram, right? Abraham, he says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, he talks about you're going to be a blessing. The whole world will be blessed through your descendants. And so God's people were blessed and ultimately Everyone around them ought to be blessed as well. Fast forwarding to Jesus, the whole world was blessed through his descendants. And so because of that, we are to be a blessing. So Jesus comes and he's been blessed by this closeness with God. And what does his life look like? He's constantly blessing other people. He's constantly giving blessings in word. He blesses them in deed. And sometimes even in gift. And so today we're called to not just be blessed, but to be a blessing to other people. To have the mindset that I have this relationship with God. I've been blessed with many things. 
how can I use these things to bless other people in my life? So as Obed was a blessing, how can I be a blessing? As Christ was a blessing, how can I be a blessing? It's super easy to go through life thinking through the lens of what can I get out of this? What can I get out of this? I want to be comfortable. I want to be happy. I want to be fulfilled. What can I get out of these rhythms? But the hope would be for all of God's people to continue to live life with the mindset of how have I been blessed, number one, by God, and how can I then be a blessing to other people? So, some questions to think about as, as we move from today would be, how has God literally blessed you? How has he blessed you? Uh, with, we think about physical possessions, but that's the least of the blessings. That's the least of the blessings. Think of all the different ways that God has blessed you. Uh, this would carry over into um, conflict and conflict resolution. Any person you have conflict with, think about that individual and think about how hard it might be to extend forgiveness, right? But this being blessed to be a blessing would even connect with that. I have been forgiven. I have been forgiven for much. Therefore, I extend forgiveness to others. And so when we think about how we've been blessed, I want us to think about all those layers of blessing, of freedom, of, and think about not just the physical blessings, but the uh, uh, emotional blessings, the, the, the mental blessings, the relational blessings that God has given us. And think through all of that, and on a, a regular basis, how can I extend this to somebody else? I've been blessed with love from God. God loves me like this. How can I show my love to my classmates in school? How can I show my love to neighbors in my life? How can I ultimately show them the love of God through me? And that's what's all packed into this idea of this blessing. People ought to be blessed when they encounter you because they're encountering Christ in you. This is still true in the minds of Jews today. I sat down with a, a Rabbi George, actually, rabbi on the hill of the, the synagogue on the hill by the, I was going to say prison. It's not a prison. Thank you, cemetery. <laughs> so there's a cemetery, and next to it is where I, I met Rabbi George, and we're hanging out in a coffee shop. I just wanted to pick his brain and ask him about uh, how they fellowship and what that looks like. Tell me what it looks like to walk in the shoes of a, a, a Jewish rabbi. I, I told him I'm in love with a Jewish man. And he looked at me kind of weird. But as we're interacting and hanging out, uh, afterwards, he said the most interesting thing, but it's tied to the blessing of Abraham. At the end of the conversation, he says to me, he says, are you happy? Are you satisfied? Did, did you get what you wanted? Are you fulfilled? Or, or did you, for what you were seeking in me, basically, are you blessed now? Because he wants to be a blessing to the people he interacts with. And it's going back to Genesis chapter 12. And it should be carried through the church of Jesus Christ. For every single one of us who've been blessed by God directly, we should be thinking, how can I extend God's love? How can I bless others in and through this? I want to close with this. At the end of Ruth, we see that we discover that this isn't just about Ruth, Naomi, Boaz. It's actually about something quite large though it used a small family to, to bridge the gap between judges and King David and that structure and reign. We see the book of Ruth opens with the term in the days of the judges. And for the listener, the hearer, the reader would say, these are horrible days in our history. It closes with this royal family ending with King David at 
in and through all of that, God was at work and he was moving through his providence, through his grace, through his provision, through his love, and he continues to bless us. And so for us, I pray that we can live life with the mindset of we serve the greatest king who reigns over the greatest kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, the kingdom of God. Pray with me. Father God, we are, we are blessed people. And I ask God that uh, as you remind us of this blessing through the book of Ruth, Boaz, Naomi, I ask God that you would continue to remind us through the Holy Spirit that dwells within each believer that we have been blessed. I pray that you would highlight many, many different ways that we've been blessed and creative ways that we can be a blessing. I pray, Lord, that you would expand your kingdom in and through each and every family member, part of Living Roots and the church in Sonoma County that people would live their lives thinking about you more than not thinking about you. I pray, Lord, that each one of us would live in such a way that we would have to explain why we do what we do by pointing to you. I pray that you would receive all glory and praise, just like you did with the birth of Obed, the redeeming son, the, the servant who points to your son who served in the ultimate way by laying down his life for us. We give you thanks for this passage. We give you thanks for these words. We give you thanks for the faithfulness of Boaz and Ruth. And we know, Lord, that they weren't perfect people, that there was a lot of flaw connected to their brokenness and their need for you. And I thank you for your grace and how the death of your son Jesus counts for them as well. We bless you today. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name that you would empower us to live blessing other people. We give you thanks and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.